We just love you and thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, gathered in your name, and uh, we thank you for being with us throughout the day, for the joy of studying together, and uh, we pray that you'd help us to be attentive and learn well and, and appreciate what we learned tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, what is the Shroud of Turin? It, it, the claim is that it's the authentic burial cloth. It's a linen cloth, and it's the burial cloth of, of Jesus, and it actually has an image uh, on it of a person that was crucified. Okay, and this is basically a, an, a painting from the from the 1500s where you can kind of see what it's all about. It was a long linen cloth, and the body of Jesus was placed in it, and then it was draped over, folded over, and and then there's an image on the cloth. And here, um, this is obviously a Catholic painting, so it's got the, the angels and all, but it's showing what it is, the Shroud of Turin, and it has the front the front uh, part of the body and the back part of the body m made on the shroud. And they claim that this is the, the burial cloth of Jesus and that image was burnt onto the cloth uh, at the resurrection, okay? Um, so some interesting statistics about the shroud is, well, first of all, it's called the Shroud of Turin because it's kept in the church in Turin, Italy, Okay. Um, it's almost five yards long. It's just a little over a yard wide. The thickness is about as thick as this undershirt that I'm wearing, so it's not real thick. Uh, and it has the image of a man who appears to have been crucified on it that you can see pretty kind of kind of detailed there. And uh, and then it's the most examined historical artifact in his in, in history, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and when you think about like King Tut and all that was found with him, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Aztec pottery and the, and the Inca and Maya, uh, all, all the different relics, uh, artifacts in the world, none of them have been more thoroughly examined as a Shroud of Turin. That right there, that, that, that kind of sparks my interest, okay? Now, for many centuries, it was considered to be a uh, fraudulent kind of relic. Uh, hello. If you don't mind joining us on the first three rows, that'd be great. Okay? Um, and the reason why it was considered a possibly fraudulent relic is because in the Middle Ages, when the, where the shroud kind of became popular, um, it, there were all these different Catholic relics. For example, this is uh, called Bera Cruz, which is supposedly a real piece of the cross. And you're like, wow, a, a, a genuine piece of the cross. That's what Bera Cruz means, the authentic McCoy. Uh, the problem is every major church in Europe had a, a, a relic of the cross. One historian said they had enough pieces of the cross to build Noah's Ark. So obviously, they, they can't all be authentic. Okay, then you have here spikes, the, the, the nails that supposedly uh, pierced his hands and feet. And obviously, there'd only be three of those, but every major cathedral in Europe had them, the authentic nails. So obviously, some of them were fraudulent. This one here is kind of humorous. They actually had hay from the manger. And you've got to ask, well, wait a minute, how, where did they get that? Hay from the manger. And the Catholics would come and they'd genuflect before and do the sign of the cross. And they'd actually get time off of purgatory for seeing these things. And, and uh, I mean, hay from the manger, they actually had Jesus' baby teeth. They had breast milk from the Virgin Mary. I mean, the whole nine yards. But my favorite is this one here, kept in a real special gold uh, container. It's the finger bone of John the Baptist. And where they got that, who knows, but they claim that it's the actual finger, not just any finger, but the very finger that pointed and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. So uh, in the Middle Ages, when people weren't so educated, they believed this, uh, but as time went on, they started saying, you know what, I'm having my doubts about this. And so when the shroud came around, they started, they questioned it and and considered it another fraudulent and Catholic relic until the 1898 when an Italian photographer took a picture of it and noticed that the image on it was a negative. 
and that good evening. And, the, and, and so that kind of surprised people. Wait a minute, how could it be a, a negative? And if you remember when we, years ago before we had the digital cameras, you would have film and you'd take pictures and then you would take the film to a place to get it developed and they'd hand you two envelopes, one with pictures and one with the negatives. And the negative, it wasn't as... It wasn't as detailed as the actual photograph. Well, that's what they have. The image on the shroud is not real detailed. It's like a negative. But then when they take a picture of it, in the picture, it's much more detailed. Okay? Uh, and so that got people wondering, wait a minute, how could they have had a negative uh, in, in the Middle Ages before we even knew what negatives were? They didn't have cameras back then. So that kind of stirred up the scientific community and people started saying, well, maybe, maybe there's something to this. And so they started examining it more closely. And this culminated in 1978 when a team of 40 scientists um, got permission from the Pope to examine the shroud during five days. There were two conditions. They weren't allowed to do any to damage it. And two, if they discovered that it was a fraud, they had to let the Pope know first, which I think is pretty fair. So this team of 40 scientists, and what I'd like us to be aware of is that of these 40 scientists, only six of them claim to be born-again believers. They come from a wide spectrum of different beliefs. Uh, some of them were Catholic. Some of them were Protestant. Some of them were um, Jewish. Some of them were atheists and agnostics. And they didn't go into their examination with this idea that, wow, it's, it's real, they came in thinking it was a fraud. In fact, one of them said, give me, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to ask you to move a little bit closer. Everybody's sitting in the first few rows here, so if you don't mind moving up a few rows. We hate to get ugly on you, but. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this one guy who was agnostic, he said, give me 20 minutes with the shroud, and I'll show you that it's a fraud. So the, the, this wasn't a team that was expecting it to be real. This was a team that was thinking it was a fraud, okay? And uh, I actually saw the pictures on the Internet of them unloading two truckloads full of equipment, the most sophisticated analytical equipment of the time. Of course, today we have much better technology, but even so, back then they had space egg space-age technology and some pretty uh, fancy equipment to analyze the shroud. So let's look at the conclusions. What did this team of 40 scientists conclude? Okay, first of all, they concluded that the image was indeed a negative, which they already knew going in, but they confirmed it here. It's a negative, and that doesn't necessarily show it's authentic, but it's, it's certainly interesting. Okay. Second, the image is very superficial. You can see here, this is a blow up of the threads and each, the, each of these is a thread. And if you look close enough, you can see that the th each thread is made up of, of about two to 300 fibers. Okay. Now, if you were to paint this linen cloth, the threads would absorb the liquid or the acid or the chemical or, or the paint. It, it would be absorbed and it would go through several layers of thread. The, the image on the shroud doesn't even go through an entire shred, thread. It just goes through two or three of the top fibers. And here the scientists were scratching their heads. How in the world did that happen? How could somebody have made this and stopped the threads from absorbing uh, the liquid. Okay, so that was interesting. Number three, the image is very detailed. Okay, and we're going to pause for a moment just to look at some of the detail. Okay, we're going to look first at the front side and just to explain the shroud. Um, it's kind of confusing here. This whole line here that you see here in this spot here in this line and this, these are creases where it was folded and then the, it, it was folded up and it was kept in a lead container. Um, I think that was so Superman couldn't see it with his x-ray vision. I don't know why they put it in a lead container. But there was a fire in 1532 in the area where it, was, where it was being held, and some nuns came and threw some water on it. And so what you're seeing here, this is not part of the actual shroud or the original shroud. This is the crease and the water stains and the burnt marks. And then these two things here, these are patches. 
and these are patches because it was folded. It, 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 the, the, the fire went through and damaged some of it, and they put these patches on it. So you're looking here at patches and patches, so we got to kind of disregard that. But it's important to understand those patches because later on we're going to talk about the carbon-14 testing that they did on it. And believe it or not, when they did carbon-14 testing, they took threads from the patches and did carbon-14 testing, and it turned out to be uh, it turned out to be from the 1300s. And so they said, "See," and this big article came out in the newspapers. This carbon-14 has shown that the that the the shroud is a fraud. It's from uh, carbon-14 proves it comes from the Middle Ages. Well, no, all that carbon-14 proves is that the patches were from the Middle Ages, and we would agree with that. The fire was it was in the 1500s, and the patches that they would have put on it would have been from from that time period. Okay, uh, and incidentally, they did carbon-14 testing a second time with pieces that they believe were the authentic and it goes back to uh, close to the close enough to the first century that it could definitely be be authentic okay uh, so but anyway what we see here is evidence of the fire but you can see the swollen cheek uh, you can see uh, his swollen abdomen you can see the nail prints and the actual blood dripping on the wrist uh, you can you can see um, the, the wound here in the side, and, and then on the back, where you, where you see the back of the body, uh, you can see blood on the scalp from the puncture wounds from the crown of thorns. You can see shoulder abrasions from, from him carrying the cross. Uh, you can see flogging, evidence of flogging all over the body. The nail wounds show up very clearly. And interesting enough, there's a ponytail. So the person who's the, who, who in, in the shroud, uh-oh, you're excited about that, that he had a ponytail, <laughs> uh, a, a ponytail, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, okay? So remember, it's very, very detailed, okay? Number four, the image is three-dimensional, okay? And, and basically what this means, uh, they had this special analyzer that looked at it, and it, and it produced this 3D image, and I don't really understand a whole lot about this to explain it, but it, what it comes down to is this. If you were to take a sheet and lay it across a, a human corpse, there's going to be parts of the body that are touching the sheet, like, for example, the no my nose would touch it, my chin would touch it, but this part in here would not touch the, the linen cloth. Okay, my chin would touch it, my chest would touch it, this part here would not touch the linen cloth, but the the image on the shroud includes even parts of the body that were not in contact with the shroud, okay? And, it, and so with that, they produce this three-dimensional image. And what's important to understand, to, for us to know is they haven't been able to explain this. They've done all types of experiments with mannequins and chemicals and ovens trying to produce a three-dimensional image on a linen cloth, and they have not been able to do it. So this is one of the mysteries of the shroud. How did the how did how is this a three dimensional image, and how could a fraudulent person uh, wanting to deceive us in the Middle Ages have been able to produce this thing that we, that with all our technology we can't replicate it today or explain it? Okay, uh, number five. This is very interesting to me. The image contains no pigment, uh, no paint, no ink, no powder, no chemicals, no acids. So what, so what caused the image? And you're talking about a team of 40 scientists who are looking at it. Uh, two of them were top forensic uh, scientists for the FBI and all types of um, equipment for magnifying it, and magnifying and analyzing, and they found no traces of, of any type of liquid or foreign substance on the shroud, okay? So it looks like, wow, it's not fraudulent. And then uh, when they magnify it, they found that the image is non-directional. In other words, there are no strokes. Like, for example, if you're painting onto a, a linen cloth, you're going to see brush strokes. Or if you're using some type of an applicator to apply, you're going to see evidence of an applicator. They found no, it's non-directional. There's no evidence of any type of applicator. So now the scientists are starting to say, wow, this doesn't look like it's fraudulent. Okay, number seven, the image appears to have been burned onto the shroud by a burst of radiation. Kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, but that kind of moves me. 
because when Jesus rose from the dead, apparently there was a burst of energy <laughs> and it burnt this image onto the shroud, okay? And that's the most logical explanation for the existence of this image. Now, considering that there's no uh, pigment or chemicals or liquids or foreign substance on it, okay? Uh, and then number eight, the blood on the shroud was undoubtedly human in origin. One of the guys on the team, one of the scientists was... Uh, worked with forensics for the FBI in the city of Los Angeles, and one of the things he wanted to do was analyze the blood and see if it was actually human blood. And sure enough, it was human blood. They could even determine the blood type. It's an AB blood type. And interestingly enough, in the Middle East, AB, AB blood type is very common, very uncommon in the rest of the world, which indicates that more than likely the person in the shroud was from the Middle East. Okay, which, of course, would include Palestine. Now, let me just take a time out for a minute and say this. If this is the real burial cloth of Jesus, then this is the atoning blood of, 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 of Christ. Well, that, that also is moving to me. Okay, uh, so now we're going to do some repetition of some of the things. Some of this is going to be new. Some of it's going to be repetition, but it's important. We're going to look at... It, Aspects of the shroud that indicate that it wasn't a fraud, okay? Uh, number one, we've already mentioned the image has no pigment, powders, chemicals, acids, no foreign substance, and there's no evidence of the use of, of an applicator of any kind. That, that's a strong evidence that it's not a fraud, okay? And before we continue, let's remember there are two possibilities. Some people will come up with a third, but in my opinion, there's two possibilities, either it is a fraud or it's genuine, okay? Some people try to claim it's extraterrestrial, but we'll throw that out, all, right? So, so logically, it's either authentic or it's not. So all this evidence that shows that it's not a fraud, that's also evidence that it's authentic, correct? Okay, so number two, the nails penetrated the wrist of the man. That's very important because... Um, in the Middle Ages, I don't know how many of you come from a Catholic background like myself, but, I mean, I saw tons of crucifixes growing up and tons of Catholic artwork. And, and uh, I mean, the middle, in the Middle Ages, there were every church every had, had, had artwork and had crucifixes. And in every single piece of artwork, the nails go through the palm of the hand. And every single crucifix, the nails go through the palm of the hand. Okay, so if someone was going to do this fraudulent, fraudulently, they would have had that mentality. The nails went through the palm of the hand. They would not have put the nails in the wrist. Okay, it's only recently, within the last 50 years, that doctors have told us that nails in the palm would not sustain or hold the weight of a, of a human uh, an adult human on a cross, but here in the wrist, there were these two bones, two bones, and a nail strategically placed in between those two bones would hold a person onto the cross. And then just a few years ago, archaeologists discovered a corpse that had been crucified, and the nail was still there, and they know, okay, the nail went through the wrist. Now we know historically and scientifically that the nail went through the wrist. Now, in case you're saying, oh, man, the, then there's a problem with the Bible because Jesus told Thomas, put your put your finger into my hand. Um, Greek is a very uh, profound language, uh, plentiful, uh, with the exception of hand. In the Greek, they only had one word for, from here to here was the hand. And, uh, and so this was also considered the hand. So there's not a contradiction in the Bible when Jesus says, put your finger here in my hand. But the simple fact that he has the nail going through the wrist would kind of indicate, wow, apparently this isn't uh, a fraud, okay? Now, the thumbs, what scientists have learned is there's a nerve here, and I'm going to get sidetracked for just a minute. Uh, you've hit your funny bone. We've all hit our funny bone at one time, right? What you're hitting there is a nerve. There's a nerve right here, and when you hit it, it smarts. And sometimes if you hit it good, man, it really smarts, okay? Now, there's a similar nerve that goes through this, these two bones in the wrist, so a nail would actually pierce that nerve. And the pain was so horrendous that the Romans had to invent a word for it. They didn't have a strong enough word in the Latin vocabulary to describe the pain of this nail 
piercing that nerve. They came up with the word excruciating. Um, and, and we still have the word today. It's a Latin word, excruciating, which means from the cross. And that's something to think about. Wow, Jesus suffered so much that they, the Romans had to come up with a, 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 a word to describe the, the excruciating pain of that nail going through the nerve. And what's, what doctors tell us today is when you do that, when you put, when you put a lot of pain uh, in, or a lot of pressure on that nerve, the thumb goes like this, okay? Um, did you see where that went? We try to keep your hands off of my stuff. Okay, so, so when you put an immense amount of pressure here, the thumb freezes in this position. And so when you die on the cross and metamorphosis, metamorphosis rigor mortis sets in, your, your, your thumb is going to be frozen in this position. Well, again, we didn't learn this until recently. Someone in the Middle Ages would have had no knowledge of that phenomenon. And yet, the, on the shroud, if you look real close, you can see that you can see the fingers but you don't see the thumb. The thumb is hidden exactly how it would have been if rigor mortis set in and, 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 and kept it frozen there. Okay, that made the scientists think, wow, this apparently is not a fraud. Okay, and then the man in the shroud had a cap of thorns, not just a crown of thorns. And again, if you look at the crucifixes and look at the artwork, there's always a crown. And so someone fraudulent would have just put the the... The wounds around here, he wanted to put wounds up here. But apparently, Jesus had a cap of thorns. Of course, the Bible never does describe it. It just says a crown of thorns, but apparently it was more like a cap. And so there were puncture marks over his entire skull or the upper part of his skull. And, and that's another thing that kind of indicates why well, it was probably not fraudulent. Okay, And then we've already mentioned the guy had a ponytail. And believe it or not, it wasn't until recently that historians uh, started telling us that in first century Palestine, it was common for men to, ha and, uh, to have a ponytail. And apparently, P Jesus uh, went along with the culture and, and had a ponytail. But if you look at all of the artwork in the Middle Ages, none of them depict Jesus with a ponytail. And none of the crucifixions and uh, on the crucifixes, he always has the long flowing hair, never is in a ponytail. But the guy who's wrapped up in the shroud had a ponytail, okay? Another indication that, well, it's probably not fraudulent, okay? And this one here takes the cake for me, okay? In Hollywood, usually people die with their eyes closed. In reality, many times people die with their eyes open. And when the coroner closes the eyes, sometimes they open back up again. And uh, that kind of gets kind of eerie in, in the funeral or in the viewing. And so in, an, in antiquity, what they would do is they would take coins and place them over the eyes, and the weight of the coin would hold the eyes shut. Well, when this burst of radiation, oh, I'm sorry, the man who was buried in the shroud had two coins placed over his eyes. One of them was a Roman call, coin called a leptin, and it, it comes from Palestine. It was minted in Pilate's time in 29 AD. So if the crucifixion was in 30 or 33, which is what most experts say it was, then, then um, there would have been ample leptin coins at that time. And, uh, and then so he had these coins on his eye, and when this burst of radiation came out of his body and burnt the image on the shroud. It actually burnt the image of the coin onto the shroud. And if you look closely, you'll see that in the leptin, they made a mistake in minting it, and they, this, it says Tiberius, the emperor at the time, the Roman emperor, and they spelt his name wrong. It's got a CPI in it. And when they look at the shroud under magnification, they see the same CPI, the, 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 it's spelled wrong on there. And all of that indicates, well, this is definitely not a fraud because someone in the Middle Ages, first of all, they wouldn't have known that he had a coin on his eye. Second of all, he wouldn't have had access. He wouldn't have known what type of coin. He wouldn't have had access. This was before trading and what have you. Before <laughs> they wouldn't have had, He wouldn't have had access to a leptin coin. He wouldn't have thought to spell Tiberius's name wrong. Uh, I mean, it just it, it, it boggles the mind. And what scientists most what, what most amazes the scientists is the fact that the radiation burn burn the coin 
onto the shroud. That's, that's pretty impressive. Okay, and then you have pollen on the shroud, and pollen is a relatively new science. It's only in the last uh, uh, couple hundred years that we've learned about pollen and that different plants produce pollen and what have you. And they have found uh, one of the scientists on this team of 40 men was a botanist, and he discovered 53 types of pollen from 53 different types of plant plants and <coughs> 33 of those plants grow exclusively in Palestine. So, I mean, to me that's interesting. And then something else that's interesting is that the pollen on the shroud traces the entire history of the shroud, okay? For example, uh, according to tradition, the shroud, the linen cloth came from India. It was a very expensive cloth that was imported from India, okay, which would kind of verify the biblical story that he was buried by Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich man who could have afforded this fine linen cloth from, from, from India. Well, the, lin, the, the shroud has pollen on it from India. It also has, as we already mentioned, pollen from Palestine. And then it was moved from Palestine to Adesda, uh, and... In, in Syria, and it has pollen. It was there for 500 years, and it has pollen in it from Syria. Then it was moved to Con Constantinople, and it has pollen on it from Con Constantinople. Then it was brought to France, and it has pollen on it from France, and then it was brought to Italy, and it has pollen on it from Italy. So the pollen it traces the entire history of it, and it definitely shows that it's not a product of France because... Uh, a middle-aged person trying to deceive us would not have known about pollen. They didn't know about pollen back then, and he wouldn't have been able to go and collect pollen from all these different places and place it in the shroud. And there are also mites on it that, uh, that, are, that also come from all the different places. So you got plenty of evidence showing that it's older and that it's been around and, uh, and it's authentic, okay? And then finally... The, the guy who was crucified had dirt on his feet, and some of the dirt on his feet got stuck to the, to the linen cloth, to the shroud, and they were able to analyze that dirt, and they found that it's a limestone that comes almost exclusively from Jerusalem. So we know that the crucified victim was, was crucified uh, near Jerusalem, okay? Okay. Uh, Interesting, okay? So now we're going to look at aspects of the, of the shroud that have no explanation. Again, we're going to see some repetition here, uh, but it's a different category, okay? We've already talked about the image being very detailed. Well, not only is it detailed, it tends to be more like an x-ray because it has, uh, you can see the teeth and even the roots. And what we have learned... This is kind of hard to explain, but they, Jesus was buried with the linen cloth, but there were several other cloths that were involved. They took, they took like a towel type of or a linen, and they twisted it up and made like a rope out of it, and they tied his hands, they tied his feet, and they tied around his head to keep his mouth shut. And there's a church in Spain that claims to have that linen cloth, uh, and it's and it has similar DNA on it as the shroud, but that's a whole other subject. But either way, th they there there is evidence even on the shroud when they look at the way his hair lies and what have you that his mouth was tied shut. Well, if his mouth is tied shut, how do the teeth show up on the image? And not just the teeth, but the roots of the teeth show up. It's like an X-ray. That's something that they have a very hard time explaining. And I've watched videos of this on YouTube, and, it, and it's interesting to hear these guys trying to explain how that, how that could happen. They don't really have an explanation for it. Number two, we've already mentioned the three-dimensional image. And remember that they've done all types of experiments trying to duplicate this. They haven't been able to duplicate it, okay? Um, number three, the man in the shroud was not unwrapped, okay? Anita a volunteer for a second. Would you, would you stand up for a minute and just l let me see your hand, okay? Uh, let's suppose this is the corpse, okay? This is the linen cloth. Now, the corpse have been brutally beaten, whipped, 
crucified. There's a lot of blood on it, okay? So when you take the linen cloth and wrap it, that blood is going to be absorbed into the cloth. And incidentally, the blood stains on the cloth go through the cloth. The image doesn't. The image is very superficial. The blood is, is, goes through the entire thing. And that blood, during the time in the tomb, it's going to dry. Then when you unwrap it, that dried blood is going to break apart, and you're going to see evidence of it being unwrapped. Okay, that's good. You can sit down. Okay? Uh, now, thank you. So this, to me, is very exciting. You've got evidence that the body's wrapped in the shroud, the body's not there anymore, but there's no evidence of it being unwrapped. How do you explain that? How do you explain it not being unwrapped? In my opinion, that's pure evidence of the resurrection. The only way to get the body out without unwrapping it is for the body to go through it and, and raise from the dead. Okay, so that's pretty interesting, okay? And then the image on the shroud... Uh, was burned on from, from radiation from a cold, dead corpse. And Gary Habermas, who's uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, who's probably the foremost authority on the resurrection of Jesus, he's written dozens and dozens of books. Right now he's working on a, on a book that's a 1,500 pages long on the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, 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 uh, this guy's like a, I mean... <laughs> He knows a whole lot about it, and what he says is that we have hundreds and hundreds of ancient burial cloths from antiquity. None of them have an image burned on them. This is the only, so this isn't some type of phenomena that you can try to explain. Uh, well, you know, this, you know it, it, it hasn't happened any time else. This is the only linen cloth, the only burial cloth that has this image burned onto it. Okay, and it came from a cold, dead corpse. Again, I see that as evidence for a resurrection. Okay, and so the team of scientists who examined the shroud, remember, many of these went into it thinking it was fraudulent. They unanimously, and to me, that, that, that alone borders on miraculous that you're going to have 40 different scientists from different beliefs, different perspectives, and they unanimously concluded the shroud image is that of a real human form of a scourged, crucified man. It is not the product of an artist. In other words, they're saying it's authentic. They're not saying it's Jesus of Nazareth, they're, they're, but they are saying it's a, it's a real human being. It's a real burial cloth. It's not a fraud. Okay? Now, I remind you what we said in the beginning there's only two options, three if you include extraterrestrials, <laughs> but, okay? Two possibilities. It's, it's real or it's a fraud. Well, they're telling 40 scientists looked at it, and they said it's not a fraud. Well, that tends to tell you it's real. It's the only other option, okay? So we believe it's the, the – they concluded that it's the genuine burial cloth of a Palestinian Jew from the first century who was crucified, but they didn't go so far as to say it was Jesus. They say, scientifically, we can't conclude that, but I think historically we can, because when we look, and what some people argue, and you'll see this on the internet, there were thousands of Palestinian Jews that were crucified in the first century. So there's no telling if this is Jesus. All we know is that it's a New Test, uh, 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 a first century Palestinian Jew that was crucified. There were thousands of them. But when we look at the scriptures, we find that there were several aspects of Jesus' crucifixion that were unique, very unique, okay? So let's look at some of those, okay? Um, some of the data that, fr from the shroud that, sh that shows us how uh, unique it was, okay? The man in the shroud had a, a swollen face. He's got swollen cheeks. He's got a broken nose. He's got a busted lip. And as a general rule, the Romans didn't beat you before they crucified you. You were beaten or you were crucified, not both. Well, this man here was, was, was beaten, okay? Uh, number two, the man in the shroud was whipped. This, image, ha this uh, image has been enhanced digitally to show you the, the, the blood marks that are found on the shroud, okay? And if you learn nothing else from, from this session tonight... I'd like you to just appreciate, wow, how much Jesus' body was beaten. When Mel Gibson 
made the movie The Passion. They actually called it pornographic violence. They thought that he took it too far. And if you remember, they, they had him being beaten on the back. Then they turned his body over and they beat him on this side. Where did he get that from? He got the idea from the shroud because the image on the shroud has the, the blood marks on the front and on the back, the beating. So he, he, I mean, he was pretty much every inch of his body was whipped and mutilated. And again, this is pretty unique. The Romans didn't whip you and crucify you. They did one or the other. And you even see evidence of that in the Scripture when he says, I'm going to whip him and let him go. And then they say, no, 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 crucify him, crucify him. So um, then the man in the shroud was, was obviously crucified. You see the nail prints, and, and you even see the blood running down, up and down the arm. Because when he was on the cross, he would push himself up to breathe and lower himself, push himself up and lower himself, and the blood is going up and down and up and down. Uh, interesting. Okay. And then the man in the shroud had his side pierced. That was uncommon because ordinarily they would break the legs. When you wanted to, a person, you wanted to s speed up the death process, yet they would break the legs. And then when, you're, when your legs are broken, you're no longer able to push yourself up to breathe. And so you die of asphyxiation. Okay. Uh, he, uh, the man in, in the shroud, was already dead, so they didn't have to break the legs. But to just confirm, they speared his heart, and the scripture says, out came blood and water, and on the shroud you have a, a mixture of blood and a liquid uh, like water, okay? Um, and then uh, you could also say the crown of thorns. I didn't add that one in there, but the, crown, the, the, the puncture marks. I mean, how many of the thousands of crucified Palestinian Jews in the first century would have had a, crown, a cap of thorns? I would venture to say none of them except Jesus, and this guy had the, the crown of thorns, okay? Um, there was no question that the man was dead because rigor mortis had sent in. Uh, in the shroud, there's evidence that, that the head was kind of like this, frozen, uh, and the thumbs are, fr are in the frozen position, so there's evidence of rigor mortis, and that throws out the window the theory that Jesus had simply gone into a coma because when you're in a coma, rigor mortis doesn't set in. So he was definitely dead, okay? And then the man in the shroud was buried in an expensive linen cloth. This is very, very unusual because in Roman times, when you were crucified, you were considered a criminal. You weren't given a proper burial. You weren't given an honorable burial. You were thrown into a common tomb, and they didn't even put a name on it. It was an unmarked tomb. But Jesus was buried or the man in the shroud is buried in a very expensive linen cloth. That's unheard of for crucified victims. Probably of the thousands of, G of New Testament Jews that were crucified in, uh, in the first century, um, <laughs> only one of them was buried in, a, in an expensive linen cloth. Uh, Jesus, okay? And again, it verifies exactly what the Scripture says, okay? And then the man did not remain wrapped in the shroud for more than a couple of days. On the shroud, we see evidence of rigor mortis, but no evidence of, of um, decomposition. So his body didn't begin to decompose. That happens pretty quickly within a couple of days, but there's no evidence of decomposition. So the, the, the body was removed from the shroud relatively quickly, okay? Uh, and, 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 and again, of the thousands of Palestinian Jews that were crucified in the new first century, how many of them would have been taken out of their burial cloth in a relatively short period of time? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, and then there was a burst of radiation from the corpse onto the shroud. And I love how Gary Habermas, or Haber, Habermas emphasizes this point. We've got hundreds of burial cloths, but none of them have a radiation burn on them. This, this is the only one, okay? Okay. Uh, burned onto the shroud from a corpse, okay? So uh, let's look at the testimonies of the scientists, some of the, these 40 scientists that looked at the shroud and see what their conclusions were, okay? Barry Schwartz was one of the guys on the team that was Jewish, okay? He was a photographer. Uh, the, he was the team photographer, and you can see him here when he was young in the 70s, and here you can see him now. And I've seen videos of him. He actually has a web page called theshroud.com. Most of the pictures in this presentation come from his web page. And he today is still Jewish. 
he has not become a believer. Um, and there are actually some people that are praying that he won't <laughs> because his testimony is, is more powerful when he's not a believer. You can, you can go on his webpage and read how Barry Schwartz says he believes the Shroud of Turin is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth. That's called enemy attestation, which has a real high, uh, 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 is very weighty in a court of law, okay? If, uh, if I was on trial for something and my mother were to show up and say, oh, Wayne, he's a good boy. He, he's got character. He, he would not have done this. That would carry very little weight. She's, she's my mom. Of course she's going to say that. But if someone who doesn't like me, someone who's my enemy, says, I, I can't stand that Wozniak, but I was there and I saw who it was. It wasn't him. That would carry a whole lot of weight in a court of law. That's called enemy attestation here. We've got enemy attestation Barry Schwartz, a Jewish man, does not believe Jesus is the Messiah. Notice that he doesn't say this is the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. He doesn't believe he's the Christ. He says Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? That's, to me, impressive. Okay? Then we have Kenneth Stevenson. He was an engineer for the U.S. Air Force. He was a Catholic in 1978 when he was on this 40-man team. And afterwards, he converted and became a charismatic pastor, like, like Pastor Terry. Okay, now, what caused this Catholic to become a charis born-again charismatic believer and, and, and go into the ministry? Here you can see a picture of him all decked out in his pastoral clothes, uh, doing a presentation similar to the one that we're doing here tonight, talking about the shroud. What caused him to become a believer? Okay, uh, interesting. And then we have Robert Rucker, um, this guy here has a Ph.D. in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan. He worked in nuclear energy for 38 years. So he knows about nuclear energy and a, a real authority on it. And notice what he says. He doesn't say, I'm pretty sure or I'm almost positive. He says, I'm 100% certain that the image on the Shroud of Turin is a photograph or more like a radiation burn. He actually corrects himself on YouTube. You'll see him saying, it's a photograph. Well, actually, it's more like a radiation burn of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I like what he says because he says, I don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because of the Shroud of Turin. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because the four Gospels tell us that he rose from the dead. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he rose from the dead and he appeared to different groups of people. There's no, I believe he rose from the dead because the New Testament teaches that he rose from the dead. But I also think, that this is him, he says, but I also think it's pretty cool that God provided a photograph for us. Of the, of the resurrection, just to give us a little extra evidence, okay? Uh, that's pretty cool. Okay, Robert Rucker, re, uh, write down his name and look him up, read about him. Uh, he's got a lot of interesting things to say about the shroud. But this is my favorite, John D. German. He was the agnostic on the team. He was the guy that said, give me 20 minutes with the shroud, and I'll show you that it was a fraud, okay? And uh, he ended up converting to the gospel, not after the examination. It took a couple of decades for him to finally come along. And these scientists, they stayed in touch, and they continued different types of experiments and dialogue and what have you. And he ended up becoming a born-again believer. And in an interview, they asked him, so you became a Christian because of the Shroud of Turin? And I love his answer. He said, nope, I did not convert because of the Shroud, but because of the man buried in the Shroud who rose from the dead. <laughs> wow. Okay. So what we learn in the, uh, studying the shroud is that um, it's got a lot of stuff that's unexplainable. And this group of scientists that looked at it, they, they determined very clearly that it, that it was not a, uh, uh, not a fraud. Okay. All right. So uh, this is ordinarily where I conclude my presentation and just say I hope that you guys would agree with Robert Rucker and with this guy. We're not going to venerate the shroud. We're not going to uh, believe because of the shroud. We believe because of the Gospels. But 
we rejoice that God left, uh, left this evidence for us, a, a radiation burn or a photograph, if you will. Now, since we've got about five minutes left, I'd like to real quick just touch on the carbon-14 aspect of it. Okay, remember uh, uh, we said that they did carbon-14 dating on it, and it came up with this age between 12 and 13, and so the, the newspaper article said the Shroud of Turin is a fake. Carbon-14 proved it. Well, actually, uh, what they did was they took, uh, they took um, from an area of the Shroud that was a patch. That's what they analyzed with carbon-14, and, of course, so the, all, they, all they proved is that the patch came from that time. And when they did the carbon-14, they kept some of the strands of thread, and they've gone back and looked at those, and they've seen that they're actually cotton. It's cotton that's been dyed to look like the color of the shroud. So we know now that, that they did carbon-14 on, on a patch, out of not, not the original linen. And so all that shows is that that patch was from the Middle Ages, not not necessarily the shroud, okay? And there's a wealth of evidence to show that the shroud is actually from the first century, okay? Uh, so um, examinations of the linen show that it goes back to the first century. It's a, it's a first century linen cloth. The, the sewing of a seam in the cloth is identical to other first century cloths that they know are from the first century, uh, and, and that's, pr that's pretty weighty. And then the coin on the eye, remember, that was from the first century. That, I mean, to me, that's a, that's a no-brainer. And then you've got Christian artwork, okay? Uh, Christian artwork is based on the image on the shroud, okay? What they tell us is that police, when they get a picture of somebody fleeing the scene of a crime, if they go to his high school yearbook and find a picture of him, and they compare them, if they find 40 points of agreement, they, they can verify in a court of law, this is the guy, this is the person who, who did it, okay? 40 points of agreement. They have over 200 points of agreement between early artwork and Jesus' image on the, on the shroud. Let me just point out a few of them, okay? Remember, his eyes were swollen because they were so badly beaten. And in early artwork depicting Jesus, he always has what they call owl eyes, real big eyes, okay? Uh, you'll notice that his hair is parted somewhat off-center here, uh, just like the guy in the shroud. You'll notice that the hair goes behind the shoulder here, in front of the shoulder here, same thing on the, on the, on the image, okay? You'll notice that uh, there's a little space here, uh, between the, the hair here and the hair here, same thing here. Uh, you'll notice a, a, a line here like a crease and the line here, and you see it even more closely in some other pictures. Here, there's, there's a random triangle in the image when you blow it up, and we're not really sure what that triangle is. It's right here in his forehead. They're not sure if that's from a water stain or a sweat stain or something, but there's some type of just like random triangle. And here in the artwork, uh, you'll kind of have to blow this up, but you can see here that there's the same random. Uh, look the image up online and look at it closely, or I think the, uh, this is saved on the church computer. If you want to get a copy of it, look at it on your personal computer a little bit bigger, and you'll see that there's a random triangle here, just like here. So, so what historians are telling us is that these images were based on these images, and these go back to the 5th and 6th century. So obviously the shroud is earlier than that. So any carbon-14 dating that says it's from the Middle Ages, we can throw that out because we've got historical evidence here that no, this is earlier than then, okay? And then you have coins. This coin comes from the, from the uh, 10th century. And notice once again, the hair parted off-center, the hair going back here behind and then in front here. Uh, notice the crease here. Uh, notice the notice the crease here in the shroud, uh, and and then and here they just put this random crease here. I mean, it's it's obvious that this this is being based on what you see here, and so the shroud has has to be earlier than that. And then this is another coin uh, from the 11th century, and the, and the same thing once again. Notice the crease. I mean, it's like come on. Um, so basically, what they're what they're when you look at these closely, it, it becomes obviously that these images were based on the image on the shroud, 
Okay, they truly believed that the image on the trial was Jesus, and they, when they made images of Jesus in early artwork, they copied it off of the image on the shroud. Okay, uh, a clear indication that the shroud goes back very early. Okay, uh, so if you hear somebody saying, yeah, but carbon-14 dating shows that it's from the Middle Ages, remember, no, carbon-14 dating shows that the patch was from the Middle Ages. The, but the historical evidence shows that the shroud was, was early. And the simple fact that we have pollen that goes all the way back to Palestine and, and, and shows that it's not uh, a, a fraudulent article from, the, from Europe, from the Middle Ages. Okay? Um, any questions? Got three, three minutes for questions. Yes. Okay, well, the, the sh well, remember, the shroud was in Constantinople for, for um, several centuries. So when the shroud was there, um, that's when they would have mint minted those coins. Uh, the, the shroud was in Adesda for several centuries, and during that time, um, different people would have had access to it. And it was, at, at one time, it was folded up, and so all you saw was the face. And, the, and that's how the Catholic Church came up with the tradition, or what, well, we're not positive, but more than likely, that's where the tradition of St. Veronica comes along, because Jesus, according to the Catholics, when he was walking up Mount Calvary, St. Veronica took a cloth and wiped the sweat off of his face, and the image of Jesus' face miraculously appeared on that cloth. And it's called St. Veronica's Cloth. Apparently, what that actually was was the folded-up shroud. And the, the, what Gary Habermas says is that in Jewish culture, a burial cloth was considered unclean. And so they didn't want it to look like a burial cloth during the first few centuries, so they folded it up, and all you saw was the face. And, uh, and, and that's why they have images of, of the face and what have you. Um, but... Yeah, it would have been accessible in Adesda. It would have been accessible in, in, in Constantinople. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. It was found in a knight's house by a widow, a knight that was killed. His widow had it. And in, in the 1300s, she started selling tickets, saying, I have the genuine burial cloth of Christ. And, and, and she was selling tickets to see it. And then at first, people were like, no, 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 that's not authentic. And then s some big Catholic bishop went and looked at it and said, nope, that's not authentic. But then later on, others looked and said, nope, we think this might be authentic. And then they ended up bringing it to Italy. So it starts out in modern history in the 1300s when it appears in a knight's home in France, and then from there was transported to to to, uh, to Italy. Okay, but there's a tradition if you study it that has the shroud being in these different places, and the pollen on the actual shroud backs up those traditions. Okay, very very good question. Okay, anybody else? Okay, well, it would. It would be, and I don't know what the original said, but it could be a simple uh, type of hyperbole. It, scripture uses hyperbole quite a bit where they're exaggerating something uh, like uh, 
strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I mean, you can't literally swallow a camel, but that's, that's hyperbole. And so when they say beaten beyond recognition, I and mean, we even see that today, we even say that today. And you're not necessarily saying, you know, uh, that that's that you can't recognize it as whatever. So, uh, but he was obviously beaten very badly. Um, so good, good point. All right. Uh, Man, I was, I was going to say something else when you were bringing that up, and now I done forgot what it was. Um, if I think of it, I'll tell you next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or tomorrow. Okay. Um, man, what were we talking about? Beaten beyond recognition. The I don't remember. It went by me. Okay. Thank you for coming out. I really enjoyed being here with you. And I appreciate you coming out on a Tuesday night to, to, to do this, and I hope you learned something. Once again, if you want a copy of the presentation, uh, bring in a memory stick and, uh, and ask the computer person on Sunday to, to download it for you. It's on the computer there, okay? And then you can look at the images a little more closely, or just go to shroud.com, and on shroud.com, which is Barry Schwartz's webpage, the Jewish guy, he's got scores of pictures uh, 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 on this, okay? All right, thank you so much for your attention, and God bless you. I was told there's no such thing as a stupid question. Very good question. Uh, they, you have to look it up online because I don't remember. But um, it was five something. It was like five nine or five ten, maybe even five eleven. But but uh, uh, but believe it or not.